<laughs> That's kind of frightening. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Happy Inter Independence Day. Everybody doing all right? You know, I, uh, I've seen a lot of people uh, today wearing red, white, and blue outfits, especially in the first service. Uh, a lot of red, white, and blue shirts and that sort of thing. You know, I had a red, white, and blue shirt I was going to wear today, but they used it to make the flag out on the tower out there. <laughs> and uh, there wasn't much left of it when they were done. Hey, if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 8. Uh, John chapter 8. And I uh, just want to say, uh, boy, I'm just so uh, grateful to you for being here today. If it's your first time or your 101st time, uh, just very honored that you would spend some time with us today. Um, you know, Jesus, when he shows up on the scene, began to preach a new message. The Jews were used to the old law, an old law that had lots of rules and regulations, and it was so oppressive that, first of all, it was impossible to keep, and secondly, it, it fostered a, a legalistic environment uh, in trying to keep every little dot in, you know, of the law, and, and, and it just became impossible and it was frustrating. Jesus shows up on the scene and begins to preach a new gospel uh, about a God who loves us and has compassion for us and extends his grace and mercy to us. And the Bible records that a lot of Jews began to, to follow him and to, to believe his teaching. Now, there was a conflict because these, these Jews were still conflicted between trying to keep the old law and embracing this grace that Jesus was talking about. And we pick up the story in verse number 31 of chapter 8. If you don't have your Bibles, you can follow along on the screen. It says uh, he's talking to the Jews who, who had believed in him. And it says, if you hold to my teaching... You are my disciples. Now, before we go any further, just to know that to hold to my teaching, uh, that, that phrase is an indication of someone who would personalize, internalize, adopt uh, a, a way of teaching. In essence, make my way of teaching your compass for your life. If you do that, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth Jesus said earlier, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So then, if you follow my way, if you adopt my way, internalize my way, commit yourself to my way, he says, then you will know me. And the truth, I, Jesus, will set you free. But they answered him and said, well, we're Abraham's descendants. We, we've never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be free Jesus replies, I tell you, how can you, or excuse me, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to that family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you today for, for loving us so much that you give us the freedom uh, in this country to worship you openly, uh, in, in public, Lord, to proclaim your word. Uh, God, we, we just do not take that lightly today, and we realize that, that that is a good gift that you have given us. And so as we, uh, as we dig into your word, I pray that we would be good stewards of that freedom. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In 1863... The United States was embroiled in a bitter civil war. On July the 1st of that year, 95,000 soldiers from the Union Army squared off against 75,000 troops from the Confederate side. And there was a bitter battle that raged for three full days, ending 148 years ago today. After the smoke and the dust had settled from that just brutal uh, battle, somewhere between 45 and 50,000 men lay dead on the fields of Gettysburg. Just a short, uh, few short months later, President uh, Abraham Lincoln 
delivered the Gettysburg Address, and he began it by saying that four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any other nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. I love that phrase that he included in there, conceived in liberty, birthed in liberty. 100 years later in 1963, Martin Luther King delivered that great speech, I have a dream. And in that speech, he challenged our nation and said that we should let freedom ring. For when we do, he said, we let freedom ring from every village, every hamlet, every state and city. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last. Free at last, thank God Almighty, we're free at last. Freedom. Eighty-seven years before President Lincoln delivered the Gettysburg Address, the Second Continental Congress gathered on July the 2nd. And in that gathering, they voted to declare themselves independent of the rule of Britain and the tyranny of their king. Two days later, on July the 4th, those men began the process of adopting the Declaration of Independence. Fifty-six men, ranging in age from 26 years to 70, signed what was in fact an act of treason against Britain in declaring our independence. And that document, in the second paragraph, it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, there's that word again, and the pursuit of happiness. Our nation was founded on this principle of freedom. And that principle has resulted in a valiant struggle, not just to, to gain freedom, but also to maintain it, to protect that freedom. And it has not been free, nor has it been cheap. And thousands of men and women throughout the last 235 years have placed themselves in harm's way so that you and I could experience the freedom of worship today the way in which we do. Thomas Jefferson said that the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time by the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is not free, nor is it cheap. But as central as the theme of freedom is to our country, man, I mean, we love to talk about freedom, right? We we love our freedom. And man, if you mess with my freedom and my rights, our elbows get out, the hackles on the back of our neck stand up, and we'll fight because you are messing with my freedom. We love our freedom. But as I speak to you today, 235 years after our founding fathers crafted this magnificent declaration, with all of the progress and all of the so-called enlightenment that our nation has experienced, we find ourselves today with more bars on our windows, locks on our doors, more prisoners incarcerated, more laws on our books, violence in the street, homelessness and hungerness that is, uh, that is rampant, debt that hangs around the shoulders of individuals as well as governments that it seems unable to bear and each year hundreds and thousands of babies are murdered in their mother's womb all all of these things in the name of freedom honestly most Americans today feel they have no freedom when it comes to trying to change 
some of these things. It almost feels like we're powerless to do so. We claim to be a land of the free, but I wonder if our brand of freedom would even be remotely recognizable to our founding fathers. Well, today we, uh, we continue a series of messages called Christian Atheism. And we've been talking about how many people will, will say that they believe in God. They will, I believe that the Bible is his word. I believe that God is the Lord of my life. And I believe that one day I will go to heaven. They say they believe these things and yet their lives say something completely different. Christian atheism. As I was preparing this message and knowing that it was going to be Independence Weekend, I began to recognize the similarity between the disparity between the, 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 the vision of freedom that our founding fathers had for our nation and the cheap freedom that we exercise today, the similarity between that disparity and the disparity that I see between the pure freedom that God intended for us as his children and the cheap grace freedom that we practice today. This is a struggle that's been going on for a long time between God's vision for freedom for us and our vision for our own freedom. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3, we begin to read in chapters 1, 2, and 3 about God who had a vision for perfect freedom. And so he created this beautiful garden, the Garden of Eden. And he formed out of the dust of the ground this man and this woman, Adam and Eve. And he did so for the simple purpose of engaging them in what I'll call perfect freedom, fellowship with him. That's what he wanted. He wanted fellowship between himself and his creation, perfect freedom. Now, this couple had this freedom. They could go anywhere they wanted to go in the garden. And I believe that God had, had hardwired them, I think he hardwires us today, with a desire for freedom. I think it's in our DNA to crave our freedom, to fight for our freedom. I think God put it in that original couple in the garden. And he said, you can go anywhere in the garden you want to go. You can do anything in the garden that you want to do. There's only one law on our books. Don't eat the fruit from the tree of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil. But you know the story, right? Satan inserts himself into this, this euphoric environment that God had created of perfect freedom with Adam and Eve. And he inserts himself into this equation and he begins to tempt the woman to, to violate this one law and eat the fruit. In chapter 3 and verse 6, it says that when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, gave some to her husband, and he ate also. And in this passage, we see the birth of of the struggle between God's idea of perfect freedom and our idea of cheap grace freedom. See, just stop and think about it. You can almost imagine this little thing playing out in their heads. They come walking around the bend in the path. There's the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Satan says, hey, man, you ought to have some of this. This is the best thing ever. And besides all that, God said, whatever he said, it, well, he didn't say what you think he said. And he began to lie to them. And we know that they were tempted. And it says, as, as we read earlier, she saw that it was good for food. And in her mind, you could almost hear her thinking, well, it is midday, and we are hungry, and honestly, we're really tired of all the other fruit we've been having, all of the bananas and the mangoes and the apples and the oranges and the grapes. And the, we're kind of tired of all that. Let's try something new. And, and besides, it will fulfill our physical needs. And when she saw that it was good and pleasant to the eye, you can imagine, right? She walks around the corner. Oh, 
that's a beautiful tree. Look at that beautiful fruit. Oh, my goodness, Adam, we have to have some of that. And when she saw that it was good to make one wise, can't possibly be anything wrong with being wiser, right? I mean, we'll be better at tending the garden if we're wiser. Uh, I'll be a better uh, uh, helper to my, to my husband. Uh, he'll be a better uh, husband to me. Uh, there's just no reason. And besides, it will elevate our status in life. And so they ate. Now, in order for them to do that, to justify it, I want you to think about what happened. They had to have forgotten some very real realities. Genesis 2.9 says that God had caused before this every tree that is pleasing to the eye and good for food to grow in the garden. Every tree they could possibly ever imagine, ever want for food was in the garden. Every one of them was there. Every tree that was beautiful to the eye that you could possibly imagine and even more was already in the garden. And yet, in spite of all this that was available to them, I want this. And they had to stop, they must have forgotten some. Think about this. There are only two human beings on the planet and God put them in charge, told them to subdue the earth and rule over it. How much more status elevation did they need? And yet, they ate. Because God loved them so much that he gave them the free will to choose. We've talked about this on and on for months, the last two or three years. That God, desire, he loves us. He desires a relationship with us, this perfect this perfect freedom, fellowship with him, but it requires a two-way street. And so he gives us free will so that we can love him back or not. And he gives them free will to choose between the perfect freedom of fellowship with him and all of the benefits of living in the garden, or they could choose this self-fulfilling of the flesh, cheap freedom, and all of the slavery that that entailed as well. He let them choose, and choose they did. Chapter 3, later on in the chapter, after they've sinned, God comes calling. And he begins to pronounce curses upon them. This is the judgment. This is the sentencing for what you have done. They were banished from the garden. Up until this point, there had never been anything uh, uh, known as pain in the garden. No pain. And yet, because of this uh, sin, now God curses him and says, pain will now be a part of your life. You will uh, bruise the heel of the serpent, or uh, the head of the serpent. The serpent will bruise your heel. And the woman would experience great pain in childbirth. And now, if you want to eat... Well, you get the privilege of working for it. All because they demanded their freedom to fulfill their own ideas, their own flesh. In The Cost for Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he writes that the demand for absolute liberty brings men to the depths of of slavery and we see that that is exactly what has happened here can you imagine the irony of this story in their attempt to fulfill the desires of their eyes they're banished from the most beautiful place on the planet in their attempt to fulfill their physical needs the, the uh, in endless uh, uh, supply of food that they once had was gone and now you want to eat you get to work and you'll eat by the sweat of your brow. And that whole idea of wisdom, I wonder, after they realized how much they had to give up just for that fruit, how foolish they must have thought of themselves. And ruling and subduing the earth, forget it. For now, the earth will no longer voluntarily surrender anything to you other than thorns 
and thistles. And I wonder if when God got to the end of his pronouncement, uh, this is the human in me uh, responding. I, I, God's got a whole lot more grace than I do. But I wonder if God, after he pr- created this environment and given them all this, this perfect freedom and set them up, and they do this, and he pronounces this curse upon them. I wonder if there was a point where God wasn't tempted just to kind of step back from them and say, how do you like your new freedom now? You need another hoe there, another shovel there, Adam? Uh, you, you understand? How, how do you like in your free- How's that freedom working out for you? Might ask you the same question. Your insistence. To obey your desires and your flesh versus obeying God's word and his teaching, his example. How's that working out for you? I know in my life, it just never works out. It's just work. And along comes this point in the service where I just want to give you a point. I hope you if, you, if you're writing things down in your notes, you write down this. Because I believe this is the point of what I want you to take away from here today. Freedom in Christ comes when we conform our lives to him. John chapter 8, when you continue in his way, when you internalize, personalize, activate his way in your life, make it the compass of your life. When you do those things, you are conforming to his way. And that is where freedom is found. See, there are laws that are irrefutable and inescapable. Freedom without rules and accountability is just anarchy. And anarchy leads to ever-increasing slavery. In the 60s, we had free love. Sex with anybody you want, as often as you want, wherever you want. Free love. How'd that work out for us? Sexual transmitted diseases, broken relationships, unplanned pregnancy, and the inability for intimacy in marriage. I'd say it didn't work out so good. Hey, drugs for everybody. Woohoo! We just it doesn't matter, you know, we'll just do whatever we want. How's that working out for you in your addiction? Ever-increasing slavery comes when we choose to not conform to God's way, but insist upon our own freedom in our own way. You know what this is? Anybody know? What is this? It's not a guitar string. This is a wire with potential. See, this is just laying here on the table. It's, it has no value. It it's doesn't do anything. It doesn't produce anything it's just a wire but you know what happens when you stretch this along the neck of a guitar and over the bridge when you begin to stretch it and tighten it up when you begin when this when this wire begins to conform to the neck and the bridge of that guitar and you begin to tune it so it's in tune with the rest of the strings on that guitar, and the player begins to strum that, and we experience this beautiful music. What happens when you and I allow ourselves on purpose, we set out to conform our lives to the neck and bridge of God, and allow Him to tighten us up and to tune us in so that we can make beautiful life. That's the life that He designed for us in the beginning Perfect freedom comes when we conform to his way. So I wonder what that looks like to us today. I want to give you three uh, uh, application points. You can write these down, take them and chew on them a little bit this week. Hopefully uh, give you something to think about. The first thing is this. Freedom in Christ means that, it's not f- that you are free from sin. Freedom in Christ means that you are free from sin. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
That word condemnation is used three times in the Bible, all three times in Romans, all three times to describe the punishment section, the sentencing part of a criminal trial in court. And he says there is no sentencing. There is no punishment stage for your sin when you are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. Set you free from the law of sin and of death. You remember the economy of the law of sin and death? Jeff talked about last week. You owe, you pay. Jesus comes along and introduces the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The new economy is you owe, he paid. God sets us free from that old law of sin and death. Romans 6, though, Paul is talking about grace, the grace that sets us free, the grace that God has extended to us. He forgives us of our sins. And he says, what shall we say then to these things? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. Some translations, it says, God forbid. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. Conceived in liberty. If we have been united with him, Like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. I love the way uh, the the message translation reads on verse 6 and 7. It says... Could it be any clearer? Our old way of life was nailed to the cross with Christ. A decisive end to that sin, miserable life. No longer at sin's every beck and call. When God liberated you from the law of sin and death, you are no longer obligated, Romans says, to the flesh. You can say no. To the flesh. You don't have to sin. You have a choice between these two freedoms because whom the Son has set free is free indeed. The second point I would make is this that your freedom in Christ, well, it isn't free and it certainly wasn't cheap. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we are admonished to take care of the way in which we live our lives on this earth. Why? Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of whom? Jesus Christ. You were expensive to redeem. And who could ever grow weary of hearing John chapter 3 and verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son his one and only son he gave because he loved you that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life Jesus paid it all so that you could be free It wasn't free, and it isn't cheap, but he did it anyway. And then finally, freedom in Christ comes with responsibility and consequences. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, moseying down the path through the garden, and they come upon this tree, knowledge of good and evil. Satan begins to lie to them, to tell them things that were were, uh, in contrary to what God had told them. They knew the truth. They knew God. And yet, they didn't run. They should have ran. They could have ran, but they didn't. 
they should have at least uh, turned their back on as soon as they saw this taking place, turned away from this, and ran the other way. Some of us, we get ourselves into binds all the time. We find ourselves being tempted. How in the world am I being tempted in this area? Well, maybe you and your girlfriend should stay out of the back seat. You understand what I'm saying? We put ourselves in these positions uh, of, uh, of temptation, and then we're shocked when it happens. And they should have ran away. At the very least, Adam should have stepped in front of his wife with a shovel and chopped the head of that serpent off. She says, oh, no, hey, pal, we ain't doing that here. Uh Uh-uh. God told me something else. He said, but he didn't. And because they chose wrongly and they sinned, the consequence for their sin is on us even today. We deal with it every day. Your sons and your daughters And their sons and daughters, until God returns, will pay the penalty for the sin of Adam and Eve. There are consequences when we choose wrongly. I think it's time. I think it's time for people who claim to be Christians to choose true freedom. Not the cheap grace that allows us to do anything we want whenever we want it and to say, well, God's grace will cover me. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to have a good time and fulfill the flesh and do what I want to do. Not that freedom, but the freedom that is found in fellowship with God by conforming ourselves to his way. That is true freedom. And it's time that we as the Christians, as the church, stand up And begin to do that. Because when we do, this nation that we're so worried about, oh my goodness, it's going to hell in a handbasket. The the nation's in trouble. It's not going to survive. Oh, what are we going to do next? Oh my goodness. And, and, And we worry about our nation. Let me just tell you this, that if the church would get right, the the nation would follow. If the church were to choose, if the church were to choose true freedom in Christ, Our nation is desperate for something other than what we have now. They will follow if we would lead them by showing them what true freedom looks like. I'm told that during World War II that American pilots would take off uh, from bases in England and they would fly over into Germany. And that they had a difficult time on the return trip finding their way back to the bases in England because of the bad weather. But the whole countryside, the landscape of of England is covered, it's just dotted with church spires and these majestic towers that rose high into the air. And the pilots figured out that if they dropped down below the clouds, the fog that was on the low-lying ground didn't cover up the spires and the towers of the church, and they learned if they would follow the churches, it would lead them home. Folks, it's true today that if you and I were to embrace this true freedom, God has set us free to run and to dance in the garden of life. All of the All of the adventure and the beauty of his presence, all of the bounty of his provision, all of the victory that is found in the spirit living inside of us are available to us today when we continue in his word, when we know the truth, and when we live free. And I say it's time for the church to live free. Father, We're not done with this sermon yet, but I just feel like that I need to stop right now and ask that you would begin to unleash your spirit into our hearts. Would you let us know, Lord, the uh, nooks and crannies of our lives that we currently experience slavery in? And Father, would you help us to know how to find victory in you and freedom in you? 
I pray that you would just remove any distractions. Would you help us to be honest with ourselves right now? We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.